We're now going to have the first of two lectures on the immune system, which is an interesting and complicated enough thing that taking two runs through it helps to fix it in your minds. It has two basic parts, the innate immune system and the adaptive immune system. The immune system evolved with certain basic design issues. One of its functions is to protect the organism against pathogens. And the problems are that pathogens can reinfect, pathogens evolve, and they're made out of the same stuff that we are. So the solution is to remember past infections, to develop a system that can respond flexibly to pathogens that have characteristics that have never been seen before, and to figure out how to recognize self and not destroy it. We are all carrying within ourselves an extremely powerful weapon that can destroy cells. And if that weapon is not appropriately deployed, it will destroy us. So that needs to be done very precisely. The innate immune system is found in all animals. You can find the innate immune system in jellyfish. It consists of some functionally autonomous defense modules, and these have all evolved to deal with different kinds of pathogens. It also has epithelial barriers. Those are ancient. Phagocytes and their antimicrobial defenses, such as lysozymes and reactive oxygen species and nitrous oxide and things like that, those are pretty ancient. It has the complement system and the acute phase proteins. So these things are all molecules that can coat or smother or attach to pathogens that are coming in. And then it has antiviral defenses, so natural killer cells, NK cells, and type 1 interferons. Those are things that have evolved a bit more recently than some of these more ancient things. But you can find these in flies and in worms and basically in many invertebrate organisms. They all have an innate immune system. It can be a very complicated immune system. It is obviously effective because invertebrates are doing just fine. They are surviving pathogen attack all the time. There are also mast cells, eosinophils, and basophils. These are anti-parasitic defenses. They are recruited uh, when things like worms invade our bodies. And this is a system that relies on recognizing patterns. So it is looking for molecules that are characteristic of pathogens and not characteristic of self. And these recognition systems are toll-like toll receptors. So they are the ancient method of looking quite specifically for something which is non-self and reacting to it. They detect conserved structures that are unique to microorganisms, and they activate inflammatory and antimicrobial anti defenses. So there is a receptor, and then there's a signaling pathway, and there's a response. This is the system that in vertebrates activates adaptive immunity. So the signals that are released are called cytokines. They're proteins that are made by one set of cells that is going to affect the behavior of other cells. And the phagocytes, which are part of the immune system, the innate immune system, are the cells that first put out this warning signal. So you can think of Paul Revere writing to Concord saying the British are coming or something like that. Then the phagocyte is Paul Revere, and the cytokine is his verbal message, the British are coming, and the response is to activate the, acute, the uh, innate immune system, the, the rapid response. So examples of these molecules are the interleukins, so there are many of them, and they are usually described as IL-1, IL-2. I think that we're up to IL-30 or 40-something. And then there is TNF is tumor necrosis factor, uh, and it is another cytokine. So what happens when 
these are released is that there's a coordinated physiological response all across the body. In the liver, there are acute phase proteins, which are secreted, and that activates complement opsonization. Opsonization is a word that is used in immunobiology to describe the process by which a bacterium or a worm is coated with host uh, protein, host complement, to make it easier for a, a, a phagocyte or a macrophage to eat that. So it then, if it's been coated with that, then the macrophage can see, oh, that's not self, that's a, that's a pathogen, I should eat it. In the bone marrow, uh, the neutrophils are mobilized, and that will lead to the production of phagocytes. In the hypothalamus, body temperature goes up, in fat and muscle, protein and energy are mobilized to allow body temperature to go up, so that produces fever, and fever decreases viral and bacterial replication. It increases the rapidity with which antigens can be produced, and it then causes a more rapid and more massive uh, adaptive immune response. Then in the dendritic cells, we're going to make the acquaintance of the dendritic cells in more detail, uh, Tumor necrosis factor stimulates their migration into the lymph nodes and their maturation, and they are the cells that are picking up molecular signals of infection and taking them and presenting them to T cells in the lymph nodes. And that then results in the initiation of the adaptive response. So the adaptive immune system is only found in vertebrates, and it's evolved independently at least twice once in the jawless, jawless fish, in lampreys and hagfish, and once in the jawed vertebrates. Their immune systems share some features, but it's pretty clear they originated independently. The key feature of the adaptive immune system is somatic generation of antigen receptors by what's called somatic recombination in mammals or gene conversion in birds. The output of this process is a very diverse repertoire of receptors. These are immunoglobulins and T cell receptors. And these receptors, as a whole, can detect virtually any antigen, whether it's self, microbial non-self, non-microbial non-self, a food antigen, or something like that. The way the immune system is organized is complicated at the tissue level. The cells that run the adaptive immune system are produced in the bone marrow. And they migrate out of the bone marrow. And some of them are going to go through the thymus gland. And they are called T cells. Others mature in the bone marrow. And they are called B cells. Okay. The cells migrate into lymph nodes, into spleen, tonsils, and appendix. The, in this diagram, these lymph nodes and processing organs are in blue. And for example, here is the spleen. Then there are particularly large and complicated lymph nodes that surround the digestive tract. They're called Peyer's patches. And one of the things that you can see is that these lymph nodes are distributed in a particular pattern. They are located at the base of the extremities, in the neck, and around the digestive tract. So they are actually in a position where information can be brought to them and they can react. When a hematopoietic stem cell, that is, what that means is that a cell which can produce a variety of immune cells when it differentiates in the bone marrow, it can take one of two paths. These cells can either go into lymphoid progenitors, and that will then take them into a B cell that migrates to the thymus, or into a T cell, excuse me, into a B cell, or if it migrates to the thymus, it will make a T cell. The B cells are differentiating in the bone marrow. Or 
they differentiate into what are called myeloid progenitors. They become monocytes, they migrate to tissues, and they become dendritic cells or macrophages. So you almost have something like a phylogenetic tree coming out of the bone marrow and taking different paths to become different kinds of immune cells. When an immature dendritic cell encounters an antigen, and you should imagine that dendritic cells are out in the tissues. They are distributed throughout the body. They're more or less sentinels or guards which have been placed in positions where they can sense an invasion. When an immature dendritic cell encounters an antigen, it internalizes it, it chops it up, it puts fragments of that on its surface, it migrates to the lymph node and it presents that to a T cell. And that then activates what had previously been a naive T cell. And that T cell then becomes something which recognizes this particular antigen. During that migration, the dendritic cells mature. That means they lose their ability to engulf pathogens and they develop an increased ability to communicate with a T cell. Essentially what that means is that they're going to deliver one clear signal. This is the specific thing I recognized. I didn't, I didn't confuse my message by eating and chewing up anything else. I just got this one thing and I brought that one thing into the lymph node. Now, in the lymph node, the cytotoxic T cells are activated. They undergo a rapid multiplication and then they migrate throughout the body and look, they look for cells that exhibit that specific antigen. And they're called cytotoxic because they will kill those cells. They kill cells either by secreting perforin or perforin or some substance that will damage the cell membrane and that will cause the cell to swell up in lice, or they induce apoptosis, and that will cause the cell to shrink and die. The hematopoietic stem cells that don't migrate to the thymus and that stay in the mature in the bone marrow yield what are called the B cell population. So in the bone marrow, they are the antigen-specific precursors of B cells. And those precursors migrate out to lymph nodes and spleen where they wait for a signal. And when a B cell receptor recognizes an antigen, usually it's being presented by a T cell or something like that, then they activate and they rapidly undergo a clonal expansion. So this is actually the stage of selection where a particular population of cells that makes a particular antigen rapidly expands. And they can then present antigens and function in immune memory. So it is actually both B lymphocytes and T lymphocytes can remain in the system and remember a particular infection. But it is a particular clone of B lymphocytes that uh, responds to a particular antigen and then undergoes massive population growth and produces an awful lot of that antigen that can circulate in the blood or that can also serve to recruit T cells. So if we look back, we see that the adaptive immune system is something that appeared abruptly in cartilaginous fish. So you should think 350 to 400 million years ago, something like that. What happened then? Well, a transposable element, and a transposable element is a jumping gene, which is actually evolutionarily related to a, an RNA virus. So a transposable element was incorporated into a cell surface receptor gene. And that enabled somatic recombination, and that is the mechanism that now generates antibody diversity. So in fact, we owe our adaptive immune response to an event whereby a relative of a virus was incorporated into our own nuclear genome. Also, the major histocompatibility loci 
the class one and class two molecules, which are a diverse array of molecules, which are used also in recognition of pieces of pathogen, they are also first found in cartilaginous fish. So it was about 400 million years ago that the big important features of our adaptive immune system evolved. The adaptive immune system can't distinguish between antigens of different origins. It relies on the innate immune system to see what kind of defense it should produce. And it has different parts. And those different parts of response defend against different classes of pathogens. So against bacteria, viruses, fungi, and helmets or worms. The mechanisms are basically arrayed in three different strategies. The immune system can kill bacterial and fungal pathogens. It can do so with phagocytes, with antimicrobial peptides and proteins, and with the complement system, or basically eat them, poison them, or smother them. A second strategy is to look at the cells that have been infected and to eliminate them with lymphocytes that will kill them. So these are normally T cells, and this is something which is usually done to an a cell that's been infected with a virus or that has an intracellular bacterium in it. Uh, that would uh, be, for example, uh, something like uh, tuberculosis uh, would be an intracellular bacterium. Or if it's a protozoan, that could also be intracellular, as in the case of malaria. So that would be a case where the pathogen is living inside the cell. The cell then has machinery to take a piece of the pathogen and present it on its own surface and then attract the immune response that will kill it. Finally, the third strategy is simply to expel a multicellular parasite, like a worm, through the mucosa or uh, otherwise. Basically, get, get the thing out into the intestine or into the urinary tract. And that's done with mast cells and basophils. As we've mentioned, immunity has costs. Each defense strategy has an associated immunopathology and a corresponding autoimmune or allergic disease. So type 1 disease would be allergy. And that's mediated by immunoglobulin E and by mast cells. Those would be food allergies and asthma. Type 2 would be a mediated by the cytotoxic cells. So lymphocytes complement an antibody can also cause pathology. Those are the autoimmune hemolytic anemias, thrombocytopenia, things like that. Type 3 uh, immunopathology would be caused by the immune complex. So that would be something antibody antigen complex diseases. Examples are rheumatoid arthritis and lupus. And type 4 would be T cell mediated. So this is where the T cells are actually attacking the wrong kind of tissue. They start to attack self. Multiple sclerosis is a case where T cells are attacking neurons in our brain and in our central nerve, other parts of our central nervous system, and causing a disease which varies from patient to patient just depending upon which population of nerve cells is being attacked. The system runs on diversity. So the adaptive immune system produces a huge array of possible antigens. This has impact on evolution because we can see that both the multiple, the uh, histocompatibility loci and the genes that are going to produce immunoglobulins are gene families. So in the course of evolution, these genes have been duplicated many times. And at each of those genes, we find that there are many alleles. This is actually, in vertebrates, this is where the maximum genetic diversity exists, and it's a testament to the power of selection to combat disease that there are so many genes with so many alleles in these gene families. Somatic recombination in B cell lineages is what generates that huge array of heavy and light chain variants in, immu in, in immunoglobulins. Those are the things which are sitting up there at the tips of that Y. 
And these function both as receptors on B cells and as plasma proteins, so immunoglobulins in the plasma that function in defense. The B cell lineages that are activated in an immune response set aside some cells and they serve as immunological memory. And the selection of these clones is what accounts for the range, the precision, and the memory of our vertebrate immune system. So to summarize, this first pass, this first look at the immune system. The innate immune system is a generalized defense. It's based on molecular recognition patterns that are shared with broad classes of pathogens, things that might be found, say, in any bacterium. The adaptive immune system, in contrast, is activated by the innate immune system. It relies on the innate immune system to tell it what kind of pathogen it's responding to. And the key features of the adaptive immune system are the somatic generation of very diverse antigen receptors, and then the clonal selection of cells with specific receptors that match pathogen antibodies. The adaptive immune system thus operates using the principles of natural selection. It's an internalization of natural selection, and it is a process that's running on the same generation time as the antigens, or even faster. Uh, it's, it's running on the same generation time as the pathogens that are producing the antigens. And that means that a long-lived vertebrate can use the principle of natural selection to counteract the rapidly evolving pathogens that have such short generation times, uh, like viruses and bacteria. And this is probably one of the reasons that we can be so big and so large and so long-lived.